Hello and welcome to the RI Science Podcast. Today's episode features mathematician Adam Kacharski with an introduction from The Times Science Editor, Tom Whipple. Adam examines the science behind gambling, including winning strategies for poker and rock, paper, scissors, and explains how to avoid losing $450 million in 45 minutes. I like Adam's book a lot. Um, The reason I like it is because it makes mathematicians feel cool. Um, I studied mathematics at university, and this is not a normal experience for a mathematician. Um, The the thing thing they don't tell you about maths when you're applying at school is the smell. a warm lecture theatre on a sunny day is quite a place to be with 200 mathematicians. Um, so, <laughs> reading this book, um, I think I felt how archaeologists must have felt when they first watched Indiana Jones and they'd you know, spent their career collecting small shards of pottery and suddenly realised they could have whips and attack Nazis and things like that. Um, it's, uh, Adam's a researcher at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, and he's a great writer, and he's written here about uh, mathematicians using secret gadgets and secret maths to beat casinos, um, and it's a great read, and it, uh, it allows mathematicians to dream, um, which is, and I, I hope you'll all enjoy hearing more about it. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you to all of you for coming along. Now, as Tom mentioned, um, I'm a researcher at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, where I specialise in mathematical models of infectious disease. So, on the face of it, my job couldn't be further, really, from the world of casinos and playing cards and plastic chips. But really, science and gambling have an incredibly intertwined relationship, a really long-standing history, and that's what I want to talk about this evening. When we talk about people taming chance and beating the system, uh, typically these are two themes that crop up quite a lot. You either have them doing something a bit dodgy, or you have them presenting a system which clearly isn't going to do something very successful. And what I want to do this evening is take a look at a third approach. Um, Take a look at some of the ways in which mathematicians and scientists have taken on games of chance and used their techniques to get an edge over the house. I also want to look at how the ideas have flowed the other way, how actually games and gambling have inspired many ideas which are now fundamental to modern maths and science. And really, lotteries, I think, are a good place to start, because for me, it was a story about lotteries that first got me interested in the mathematics of betting. Uh, As I'm sure any of you who've played lottery or thought about playing lottery will know, it's incredibly difficult to win. Um, But actually, even the way we measure how difficult it is to win is a fairly recent development. Although maths uh, has been around for millennia, the idea of how we quantify luck, how we quantify a random event, uh, is a relatively recent one. It was one that was developed in uh, the 16th century. And it was actually in Renaissance Italy. There was an uh, Italian uh, called Gerolamo Cardano. He was a, a physician. As a doctor, he was uh, the first to describe the clinical symptoms of typhoid. Uh, he was also a gambler. And as a gambler, he was the first to describe such games mathematically. And he actually outlined um, what's known as the sample space. So this is the, all of the combinations of events that could occur. And obviously, if you're only interested in one of those, that gives you a sense of how difficult it is to win. Now, for the UK National Lottery as it stands, you have to pick six numbers from a possible uh, set of 59. So this results in just over 45 million possible combinations of of numbers you could pick if you bought a card. Uh, Clearly, this makes life very difficult for you uh, to win the jackpots. But there is a way that you can guarantee you will win the lottery uh, this weekend. And that is quite simply to buy up every single combination of numbers. Now, that might sound a little bit absurd, uh, but let's just just run with it for a moment. Um, As I said, there's 45 million combinations of tickets for the UK lottery. So if you were to buy up every single possible combination uh, and line them up end to end, it would actually stretch from London uh, to Dubai. Um, What's more, each ticket costs two pounds. So if you really want to win the jackpot this weekend, it's going to cost you about 90 million pounds to achieve. Clearly, that's not a feasible strategy, but not all lotteries are the same. Um, In the 1990s, for example, the Irish National Lottery had a much smaller sample space, a much smaller possible combination of numbers that could come up. In fact, there were about 1.94 million combinations. 
Each ticket cost 50p, so as a result, it would cost you less than a million pounds to buy up every single combination. And actually, a syndicate headed up by an accountant um, got thinking about this. And clearly, in most weeks, this is a pretty poor investment, because the jackpot would be maybe a few hundred thousand. And if you're spending almost a million to win a few hundred thousand, it doesn't take much to spot. That's a pretty bad investment. But if a rollover were to come around, yeah, maybe this could be plausible. And actually, um, rather than stretching to Dubai, if you lined up all of these tickets and the combinations end to end, it would actually stretch from London to Plymouth. So, you know, you've got something that's a bit more doable. And what they started to do is collect together these tickets and fill each one out by hand to get every single one of these combinations. And then they waited. They waited for about six months uh, until the Maybank holiday in 1992 when the rollover hit 2.2 million. And they put their plan into action. They took all these tickets they'd filled out, started taking them to shops, and buying them up. Um, and in many cases, this raised some attention. So shops that would usually sell maybe 1,000 tickets in a week were suddenly selling 15,000. Uh, the lottery, yeah, perhaps expectedly, frowned upon this a little bit and tried to stop them. Um, and as a result, when the lottery draw came around, they'd only bought 80% of the possible combinations of tickets. So it's still an element of luck as to whether they'd win the jackpot. Fortunately for them, um, that jackpot winning set of numbers was within the combinations that they bought up, so they won uh, that week. Unfortunately, there were two other winners that week, <laughs> so they had to split the jackpot. But when you added up all those lower tier prizes that they matched at five numbers, four numbers as well, they walked away with a profit of £300,000. Um, now, for me, years ago when I heard the story, that was just a fantastic illustration of how you can take a pretty simple mathematical insight, a good dose of audacity and hard work, and convert it into something that's uh, profitable. And um, yeah, this isn't the only instance that people have targeted these kind of games. Uh, for the UK lottery, the draw is random. So really, the only way you can guarantee a win is to use this brute force approach by simply buying up all of the combinations. But not all lotteries are the same. Take scratch cards, for example. On the face of it, scratch cards are completely random. Um, if, you, if you kind of think about it, they can't be completely random. Because if you're producing scratch cards and you just randomly generate which cards are going to be winners, there's a chance that, by sheer chance, you will produce too many winning cards. If you're a company making scratch cards, you want some way of controlling and limiting which prizes go out. Um, as statisticians would call it, you need controlled randomness. You want the prizes to be fairly uniformly, evenly distributed amongst locations, but you don't want the generation to be completely random. And actually, in 2003, a statistician called uh, Mohan uh, Savansa was thinking about scratch cards. He'd been given some as a joke present and uh, was wondering about this idea of controlled randomness. And he realized there must be some way for the lottery to identify which cards were winners without having to scratch them off. On each card, there were a series of digits. And some of these would appear two times, three times. But some numbers uh, and symbols only appeared once on the card. And actually, if these unique numbers appeared in a row, that card was always a winner. And he went and bought more cards and tested out his strategy, and every single time, the cards that had these numbers in a row um, were guaranteed winners. Now, what would you do in this situation? You've essentially cracked scratch cards. You've got a system which can identify the winning ones and the not winning ones just by looking at them. But you go out and buy tons, what would you do? Winning scratch cards are remarkably rare. And actually, what Mohan did, rather than just going on a huge scratch card buying spree, was um, work out how long it would take him to buy up enough cards and guarantee himself a winner. And he was a statistician um, working on geological problems, earning pretty decent money. Um, and he realized that actually, although he had a winning lottery strategy, it was better off just to stick in his existing job. <laughs> So what he did um, was he rang up the lottery and told them that there was a hidden code on their scratch cards and he had deciphered it and he knew how to win. Um, the lottery, of course, didn't take him seriously. Um, so what he did was actually collected the, the scratch cards and he identified some winning ones, some uh, losing ones, divided them into two piles and posted them by courier to the lottery. That evening he got a phone call from the lottery saying, we need to have a chat. <laughs> and Really, this story um, is representative of a lot of areas of gambling. Often, it's not professional gamblers who come up with these strategies that beat the system. And often, people who beat the system don't become professional gamblers. For a lot of these people, gambling is almost a playground for ideas. It's a way of testing out problem solving and skills that actually will apply to many other industries. People um, who have targeted these problems have moved into academia, into finance, into business. And as I mentioned with Cardano, uh, this isn't a new phenomenon. Really, throughout history, many of the great thinkers and mathematicians have used gambling as a way of refining their ideas. 
In around 1900, a French mathematician called Henri Poincaré was um, particularly interested in gambling. Now, Poincaré was one of the, what's known as the last universalists. As a mathematician, he was one of the last people um, to specialize in almost every area of the subject as it existed at the time. It hadn't expanded to the point um, where it was as large as it is today. And one of the things he was interested in was predictability. And to him, um, unexpected events, unexpected outcomes were the result of ignorance. He thought, if something's unexpected, it's because we're ignorant of the causes. And he classed these problems by what he called the three levels of ignorance. And the top level was a situation where we know what the rules are, we have the information, we just have to do some basic calculations. So if you've got, say, a school physics exam, you know what the phys physical laws are, you're given the information, so you know, in theory you should be able to get the right answer. If the answer is surprising, then you've done something wrong in the working. But it's not a kind of difficult level of ignorance to escape in theory. The second level of ignorance, according to Poincaré, was one where you know what the rules are, but you lack the information necessary to, to carry out the calculations accurately. And he used roulette as an example. So a roulette table, you start a ball spinning round and round, and he observed that a very small change in the initial speed of the ball could have a very dramatic effect on where it ends up, because it's going to be circling this table over time. And nowadays, mathematicians refer to this as sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And popularly, it's known as the butterfly effect. Um, there's a talk in the 70s where a physicist pointed out that um, a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil could cause or perhaps prevent a tornado in Texas. These very small changes which Poincaré first observed could have a very large effect later on. And then we'll say that the result is random. It's down to chance. But really, it's a problem of information. Then comes the third degree of ignorance. And this is where we don't know the rules. Or perhaps they're so complex we'll never be able to untangle them. And in this situation, all we can do is watch. Watch over time and try and gain some understanding of, of what we're observing. And it was really this level of ignorance when gamblers started targeting roulette that they focused on. They didn't try and untangle all of these uh, physical laws. They just said, well, let's just watch a load of roulette spins at a table and see if there's a bias, see if there's something odd going on with this table. But this raises the question of what do we actually mean by odd? What do we, what do we mean by biased? And while Poincaré was thinking about roulette in France, on the other side of the uh, channel, a mathematician called Carl Pearson was also thinking about roulette. Uh, and Pearson was fascinated by, by random events. As, as he said, we can't have any true sense of what nature does. We can only observe and try and make inferences on those observations. Um, and he was really keen to collect random data to test out these kind of ideas. On one occasion, he spent his summer holiday flipping a coin 25,000 times. Um, to generate a data set to analyze. And he was also interested in roulette. Now, fortunately for him, at the time, uh, the Le Monaco uh, newspaper would publish the results of all the roulette spins in the casinos of Monte Carlo. Now, for Pearson, this is a fantastic data set. He wants to test out his ideas about randomness. You've got all these uh, previous roulette spins to test it out on. And he started looking at ways to understand whether they were random or not. And a uh, roulette table, of course, you've got these black and... Um, red numbers, and then you've got a zero. And if you take out the zero, over time you'd expect the proportion of black and red to be even. You'd expect it to kind of be 50-50 over time. And when Pearson looked at the data, he found that red came up 50.15% of the time. This was over about 16,000 spins. So according to his calculation, this wasn't that implausible. So actually that kind of deviation from the expected value is reasonable given the kind of data set he had. But then he continued, and he looked, for instance, at how often pairs of numbers appear. Now, if you've got a random process, a roulette table, sometimes you'd expect there to be a string of the same color appearing purely by chance. You might get a few reds coming up, a few blacks. Uh, but what Pearson found was that the numbers switched too often. Actually, you didn't get these strings of the same color appearing as often as you might expect. They were kind of switching over. And to him, this was pretty definitive evidence that the tables were uh, corrupt, that they were biased. And as he puts it, if I had been observing these tables since the start of geological time on Earth, I would not have expected to see a result that extreme. And he actually suggested that they close down the casinos and donate the proceeds to science. Uh, as it happened, there was something um, a little bit more down-to-earth going on. It turned out that those uh, journalists from Le Monaco, rather than sitting by the tables and recording the numbers, instead have been sitting in the bar and making them up. <laughs> But this idea, um, think, back, think back to how he phrased it, that it was the probability of observing an event as extreme as the one I've observed. Um, this was the, the first kind of forays into what's known as hypothesis testing. Um, nowadays, you know, whether we work in clinical trials or on particle physics experiments, we use the principles that um, Pearson honed on these roulette tables and coin tosses 
to understand whether we have enough evidence to reject or accept a certain hypothesis. So in this case, his hypothesis was the tables were random, and he had enough evidence to say that this wasn't the case. And actually, gamblers have also used these ideas um, throughout Victorian times and uh, moving into so in the late 1940s, for example, two medical students uh, used these kind of methods to go, and unlike the lazy journalists, they actually watched the tables this time, collected all the data, and found that there were biases. These tables wore down over time, and certain numbers or areas would appear more often than not. Um, and actually, they went around Nevada and gambled a lot of these tables, and the exact figure was never known, but they did buy a yacht and sail it around the Caribbean for a year. So, <laughs> a pretty successful strategy. The problem for gamblers, though, is casinos kind of cottoned on to what they were doing, and they would make sure that the tables were incredibly well maintained, and you didn't have these biases occurring. But in the 60s and 70s, some physics students realized that this actually leaves you in the second level of ignorance, because if you've got a very pristine, well-maintained roulette table, it's not a statistics problem, it's a physics one. As one of them said, it's, it's kind of like having a planet orbiting a point. You've got this ball going round. In the 70s, a group of students at University of California, Santa Cruz, um, actually kind of started doing these calculations. And they, they looked at a roulette spin. They said, well, to start off with, um, the croupier will spin the ball. And it will go around um, the, the edge of the track, around the rim of the table. And often it will go around a couple of times before the croupier calls no more bets. So in other words, you have a window in which you can collect information on what the ball's doing and act on it. You can place bets during this period. Over time, it would drop down onto the track and sort of spin freely. They eventually hit one of these deflectors and land in one of the pockets. And what they actually did, um, testing out their strategy on different uh, tables in their lab, um, was realize that if you could calibrate your model, so if you could write down the equations for the physical system, you've got the ball going around, it's slowing down, and then it drops down. If you could write down these equations and calibrate them to a specific table, then in that initial bit of time, you could collect enough information to improve your predictions about where the ball would land. You'd never get it exactly, but you didn't need to. You just need to get some idea of which region of the table it was going to land in, enough to get an edge over the casino. It's all well and good, of course, doing that in a classroom and working for all the, occasions, uh, all the equations, but in a casino, you need to do it in real time. You need to do that on the casino floor as the ball is spinning. So what these teams actually did was come up with hidden computers um, to do these calculations in person. Now, Wearable technology is, of course, all around us these days, but the first wearable computer was designed for this purpose, <laughs> as it happens. Um, and because it was a new technology, there were, of course, some drawbacks with this. Um, they'd often give themselves electric shocks, for example. <laughs> uh, and as well as this, as I mentioned, things are very sensitive to initial conditions. So if the weather changed, they would need to recalibrate to the to let table. On one occasion, they were actually losing a fair bit of money and couldn't quite work out why until they realized there was an overweight tourist further down leaning on the table and screwing up all of their predictions. So really these kind of methods were, were somewhat imperfect and in theory they worked very well um, but these kind of stories have been a bit sporadic. Um, but it wasn't just roulette during this period that gamblers started targeting. They also started targeting other games. And the whole idea of card counting, so if you have games like Blackjack, you're, you're trying to get to a certain total, um, playing the dealer, and you know, in Blackjack you're trying to get near to 21, but not go over. So you've got to draw cards and, and try and get near this total. And on the face of it, this is a random game. The draw is completely random what will come out. But of course, it's not for, for a deck of cards, because if certain cards have already come out, they can't reappear until you shuffle the deck. So if you can collect information on what's already appeared, this can potentially give you an edge over the casino. It can give you an advantage against them. Now again, the casinos started realizing what players were doing, that they were tracking what was in the deck. So they started using more decks of cards. Rather than one, they would use um, a whole pile. And this made it much harder to card count, because if there's multiple uh, of the same card in the deck, it's much more difficult to keep track of, of what's come out and what hasn't. But the casinos were inadvertently handing the gamblers a very significant advantage. Because at the time, casinos typically used what's known as a dovetail shuffle. So this is probably familiar to you. You split the deck in two, you riffle the cards together. Um, now, a dovetail shuffle, if you do it once, preserves an enormous amount of information about the cards. So just to give you an example, let's say we have a sequence of cards in order from ace to king. If we do a dovetail shuffle, we split them and then we riffle them together. Now, they might not fall exactly interwoven. You've got two quite clear what's known as rising sequences of numbers. So cards have been shuffled, but actually, if you know where they started, at each point as you go from left to right, you know there's only one of two cards that could be appearing. And um, actually, there's a number of magic tricks that rely on this fact. So if you get a deck of cards and move one and then riffle shuffle, um, you can spot the, the moved card because it won't fit into one of these rising sequences. 
And actually, mathematicians have shown that for this kind of shuffle, you need to shuffle a deck at least half a dozen or so times to get something that's as good as random. And in casinos, in that period, people were actually only shuffling them once. So really, if you can track what's happened, you've got a huge amount of information about what's going on. Um, and in many cases, they would actually sneak computers in, again, uh, another application of computers in casinos, to track the cards that have come previously. And whereas before, card counters would measure what's come and then get kind of some approximation of, of what's left, now they would actually, at each point in time, know that it's only one of two cards that could appear. So this is a terrific advantage uh, that they had. But implementing this strategy, of course, um, for card counters can still be a problem. As one card counter I talked to um, said, learning to card count is easy. Learning to get away with it is very difficult. And many of these people who were successful, people like Bill Benter, soon became pretty well known in the world of casinos and found themselves banned from all the way around the world. The mathematics of games and these kind of features have been an interest to mathematicians for a long time. Um, actually, the origins of game theory, the origins of mathematics of games, originated with poker. Uh, in the 1920s, a researcher called John von Neumann um, Brilliant mathematician. He was the youngest professor in the history of the University uh, of Berlin. Wasn't so good at poker, though. Um, on the face of it, poker is a perfect game for mathematician, right? It's the probability you get a certain hand, the probability your opponent gets a different one. But von Neumann realized that there's more to it than that. As he said, real life consists of bluffing, of little tactics of deception, of asking myself, what does the other man suppose I'm going to do? And he wanted to study that kind of feedback between what you think and what they think and they think you think. And he looked at very simplified forms of poker. And one situation he looked at was two players. Um, they each get dealt a single card, and then they put some money in the pot at the start. And the first player has the choice. that so They can either just stick with their bets, in which case they just turn over their cards and compare them, or they can raise the stakes, and then it's up to the second player to decide whether they meet that bet or not. So two players, one card, money in the middle. What von Neumann found is that in these kind of games, you've got almost a tug of war, because each player is trying to maximize their gain while simultaneously trying to minimize their opponent's gain. If you think of a game like poker, anything your opponent wins comes out of your pocket. So you're trying to maximize what you get while at the same time trying to minimize what they get. Which means that there's this kind of equilibrium point. There's a point at which the, the two um, sort of conflicting forces balance. Um, and in this situation, analyzing it for the game, he found that this situation in which no player would benefit by changing their strategy, this, this balance point um, for the first player, the strategy was as follows, that if they got a very high card, then they should raise the stakes. Intuitively, this makes sense. If you have a good card, you, know, you might as well bet on it. If they had a middling card, it didn't make sense for them to raise the stakes, they didn't have a great chance of winning, but they still had some chance. So in other words, they should just stick with their existing bet. But when von Neumann looked at what happened when you got the lowest kind of cards, he found that it doesn't make sense to stick with your bet, because if you turn over the cards, you're probably going to lose. Instead, you should up the stakes. So in other words, you should bluff. And actually, uh, up to this point, gamblers had often, you know, poker players had often bluffed in games, but it was always seen as a quirk of human psychology, a kind of innate trickery that humans came up with. But here was von Neumann showing that it was a mathematical necessity. In other words, he'd proved that bluffing is a necessary part of life. And you know, this, this idea was kind of fundamental to game theory, that you can have these strategies put together. In this very simple version of poker, though, there's almost a list of fixed rules we can follow. So in other words, if you get a high or low card, you raise the stakes. If you get a middling card, you stick with what you've got. And in any, any game where you've got all the information in front of you, so other games, for instance, things like noughts and crosses, checkers, chess, all of these games, in theory, have a fixed set of rules. It's known as pure strategy. So you follow these exact rules, and you'll get the optimal result. So if something like noughts and crosses, I think most people can kind of work it out when they're younger, that they, they realize there's a set of moves, and if they always do that, they always get the results. Uh, that's the best possible. Of course, not all games are like this. Uh, a good example is rock, paper, scissors. So it might be admirably consistent of you to always pick the same one, but if your opponent spots what you're doing, they can take advantage of that. So it's not the kind of optimal strategy if you're trying to make your opponent's decisions as difficult as possible. In these kind of games, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to make your opponent indifferent to changing, because you've got that tug of war going on. So if they can gain more by adopting a different strategy, you haven't got the optimal approach. And in Rock, Paper, Scissors, if you want to make your opponent's choices as difficult as possible, what you can just simply do is pick randomly. If you pick completely random um, options uh, amongst those, then in the long run, your opponent won't be able to make any money off you. So this is kind of the optimal thing to do. 
And what paper says is there's three options. It's not too hard to work out that picking randomly will make your deci uh, opponent's decisions difficult. But games like poker are far more complex. You have a, a whole array of choices that you can make through the game. So it's not something you can actually write down with pen and paper. Unfortunately, we can turn to a technique that um, one of John von Neumann's colleagues devised. And this was a mathematician called Stanislav Ulam. Um, and unlike many mathematicians, he wasn't a big fan of working through loads of equations. Uh, on one occasion, he was working on a blackboard, trying to solve a quadratic, got to the end, and was just so frustrated and annoyed, he went home for the day. So it really kind of wasn't his thing to kind of crunch through all this uh, algebra. And he was once um, playing Can Canfield, which is a version of Solitaire. And he wondered what the probability would be if he just laid out the cards. What's the probability he'd have a situation where he could win that game? The cards would fall in a favorable way. Started looking at calculations and realized it was just a lot of effort. So instead, he thought, well, what if I just lay out the cards a few times and see what happens? In other words, what if I just simulate this process a few times and get some sense of, of how likely it is? At the time, uh, Ulam and von Neumann were working on the US nuclear program at Los Alamos. Um, working on neutron collisions. Um, part of the project was the hydrogen bomb. And again, these were random processes where you couldn't neatly write down the formulas and solve them. And they realized that this method would be incredibly powerful for that. Um, being a government program, they needed a code name for it, so they called it the Monte Carlo method, because Ulam had a heavy gambling uncle at the time. And the Monte Carlo method has become a fundamental part of science. I mean, in my line of work, where we try and look at disease outbreaks, you have something like Ebola or Zika, that's an incredibly complex set of interactions. It's not something you can write down with pen and paper neatly. And so we use these simulation-based approaches, simulating these random processes to understand these systems. Um, it also appears in areas of sports betting when you're trying to, to understand um, how these very kind of complex team interactions work. And it also applies to poker. Teams have used this kind of um, approach for games of poker where you can't neatly solve uh, the equations. You can use a simulation-based approach to get the computers to learn. And actually, Alan Turing, one of the fathers of computing, and when he was first thinking about this idea of machine learning, said that actually, if you're trying to build an intelligent machine, it doesn't make sense to build the adult mind. You don't want to try and build the finished product with all the knowledge and rules there. It makes much more sense to build the child's mind and let it learn, let it work out how to play um, these kinds of games. And this is what these poker teams do. They create these algorithms that can learn. And actually, the way in which they learn um, is, is perhaps a bit surprising, because what they do is they get these algorithms over time to employ what's known as regret minimization. So as they, they play these games billions of times against each other, at each point when they've made a decision, they look back and say, could I improve that if I'd done something differently? So at each point, they kind of have an artificial measure of regret for each decision they make. Um, and actually, there's, there's a lot of evidence from uh, some new, neurological studies, neuroscience studies, that um, that ability to have regret is quite, quite important in learning games of chance. There's been studies of people who have damaged the bit of the brain that's responsible for regret, this ability to kind of look backward and ask, how, how would I feel if I'd done something differently? And those people often are, are perfectly capable of playing logic games. If they have to sort cards, absolutely fine at that. If there's any, any element of risk to the game and they have to learn how to play the optimal strategy, that's something they really struggle with. Um, and actually, a lot of economic theories developed not around looking back, but around what's known as expectation maximization. So in other words, you look forward and you say, if I did this, could I make money? If I did this, could I make more? But really, from these kind of uh, artificial intelligence approaches, it seems that it's much more powerful to look back and kind of employ that power of regret as you go to kind of look back on your decisions as you take these risks. And in fact, these teams have employed these algorithms and got these computer bots to play each other so many times that last year they announced that poker is solved. Well, for, for, to be specific, for two-player poker where the, the stakes have a limit, um, these bots have played each other so many times that they've come up with a strategy uh, which will not be expected to lose money in the long run. So even if you're playing a perfect opponent, this bot would not lose money over the course um, of a sort of very long game. Um, interestingly, actually, a lot of the players who came up with this system, uh, a lot of the, the computer scientists aren't very good at poker themselves. By their own admission, they're not poker players. So this is a kind of remarkable illustration of the power of these algorithms. You can have people who aren't particularly good at poker creating poker bots that can beat any human, um, arguably. But there, you know, this is a remarkable achievement, but there is, of course, a downside of this, and that you're assuming that your opponent is perfect. If you're kind of looking for this optimal strategy, that's inherently defensive, because you're assuming that your, your opponent's perfect, and you're almost giving them too much credit. Because if you've got a flawed opponent, and you're coming up with a strategy that assumes they're perfect, you're, you're kind of potentially not exploiting them as much 
as you could. And just to give an example of these kind of flaws that could occur, um, let's go back to rock, paper, scissors. Um, so typically in these kind of big competitions where people play lots of times, um, it's the novices that open with rock, often men. Sorry. Um, scissors tends to be the kind of most popular people who play a lot of these games. Um, and the paper's not always chosen so commonly. And in one sort of fairly large study of rock, paper, scissors, what happened was people who win the first round uh, typically stick with the same move for the second go. So it's this kind of old um, the military adage, isn't it, of generals always, fought la uh, always fight the last war, especially if they won it. So this idea that if you won, you just stick with what's safe. People who lost, however, um, will often switch to the move that would have beaten uh, the one they lost to. So if they lost to rock, they'll often swap to paper on the next go. So it doesn't always happen, but in these kind of large um, competitions, these kind of patterns emerge. So although the optimal thing to do in rock, paper, scissors is to behave completely randomly, People don't. They fall into these predictable patterns. And there was actually a story um, a few years ago in Japan. Um, an electronics firm wanted to auction off their art collection. And they approached Christie's and Sotheby's to hold the uh, auction. They were obviously both keen to do it. And so the head of the electronics firm decided the fairest way to settle it would be with a game of rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> now, Sotheby's thought, that's perfectly random. That's nice, that's fine. Um, Christie's, however, he, the, the CEO in Japan had a young daughter, a seven-year-old, who played relentlessly in the playground. So he got his daughter to teach him a bit of rock, paper, scissors strategy. And they walked in, sure enough, to the boardroom. Um, Sotheby's treating it like a random game. Christie's with a strategy. Christie's walked out the winner. So in this kind of case, exploiting those patterns and those kind of predictability and knowledge of what's happened before can be um, extremely valuable. But there are some disadvantages to learning about your opponent and remembering things and trying to take advantage of them. And that's, if, the, if your opponent is incredibly smart, they could teach you the wrong image of themselves. So it's what's known as the get taught and exploited problem. If you're playing poker, for instance, your opponent could pretend to be very passive and pretend to be very timid. And then once you've kind of learned that notion of how they play, they could actually switch their behavior and exploit the fact that you've learned the incorrect perception of them. Um, it's not just poker this happens. A couple of months ago, uh, uh, you may have seen it, uh, Microsoft launched a, a bot for Twitter to learn from, a few you can see where this is going, um, to try and learn language. And the idea was have, have conversations and improve its ability uh, to learn. Uh, Twitter users unfortunately decided to teach it some unfortunate tricks. Um, what actually happened in 24 hours, it had to be taken down because it was coming out with so many horrendous opinions. <laughs> I think that's an example of, you know, you have quite an intelligent algorithm, but if it's being fed the wrong image of, of what it should be doing, it can actually veer off track very quickly. And at this point, I've you know, talked about poker bots, which play billions of games to refine their strategy. I've talked about these, these language bots. Um, but in many situations, uh, these bots aren't very complicated. In finance, for example, uh, programs... Uh, are designed to be fast. If you're trading, if you want to get a trade off, you need to do that quickly. So having that huge amount of complexity and nuance and, and rationality in your algorithm isn't going to do the job. You know, you really want to strip it down as simple as possible. And in many cases, these high-speed algorithms, you might just have a few lines of code. Uh, and as one uh, economics researcher um, I talked to you put it, when you have 10 lines of code, you're not even at insect level intelligence. You know, you've got no rationality and no nuance in there. You're, you're just trying to execute the, the, the trades as quickly as possible. In some situations, this means that you can run into trouble. There's a case um, recently in Norway where two traders had noticed that a US stockbroker had an algorithm that was feeding trades into the market, and the algorithm would always react to a trade in the same way. So in other words, if you traded with it, it would change its price by the same amount, no matter how big that trade was. So what these um, people in Norway did was teach the algorithm what to do. So it would make lots of little trades, so it would move its price up. Then it would make a big trade and profit from the difference. Now, this ended up in court. Um, these two traders were charged with market manip manipulation and handed suspended sentences. Um, but then uh, there's kind of a, a Robin Hood reputation in the, in the media for them uh, in Norway, and it went to appeal. And their uh, appeal law made the point of, if they had been trading against a stupid human who was doing this, that wouldn't be a problem. The issue is that they were trading a stupid algorithm presumably created by a human that hadn't been thinking what they were doing. And how should this be different? How should the notion of skill and responsibility be different because there's that kind of one step um, away from the argument? And actually, this argument held in, uh, in court, and in this situation, um, they were actually, you know, this, this sort of sentence uh, was revoked. And it, it isn't the first instance that these very simple algorithms run into trouble. Um, 
uh, a, a similar point, actually, um, a US stockbroker was introducing a new algorithm to feed orders into the market. So you have a lot of orders from clients coming to the stockbroker, and it would want to feed them in. And they had eight servers doing this. Um, what they had is a counter, actually, to keep track. Because obviously, if you've got lots of orders coming in, and you're sort of sending them out to the market, you want to keep track of how many you've, you've completed. You don't want to kind of accidentally make too many. And they had one of these counters on each server. And then they updated their software. Um, but by, by all accounts, they didn't add the counter to the eighth server. So there are seven servers that knew what they were doing the eighth one that was kind of doing its own thing. And when this went live, what happened was the seven were behaving as they should. The eighth just peppered the market with high-speed trades. And actually, by the time they, they worked out what was happening and shut it down, in 45 minutes, it had lost um, about $450 million. So that's, that's $170,000 a second for this runaway algorithm because it was acting so fast and so uh, much beyond what kind of humans could uh, control. And you might call that bad luck. You might call that... Um, uh, a sort of error in skill. And I think those cases around um, you know, these kind of games and, and chance events are, are developing. Actually, in the US in recent years, there's been a big crackdown on poker, um, uh, particularly online. And as well, uh, in 2012, there was a crackdown on New York and poker rooms. And a gentleman who was running a poker room was, was taken to, to court and charged with operating a gambling operation. Now, many casino games in federal law are um, defined as gambling. But poker isn't one of them. So actually, the, whether it was gambling or not was kind of up for debate. And in federal law, gambling is defined as anything that is predominantly due to chance. So any game that's predominantly the result of chance is defined as gambling. Um, so what happened is this entire legal case rested on, is poker a game of chance or a game of skill? And they got economists coming in, mathematicians. Um, and they made the point that on a single game of poker, of course there's an element of luck, because you've got this deal. But then equally, you know, in baseball, someone pitching a single ball, there's going to be an element of chance involved. But over the course of a poker game, typically the more skillful players won. And this is the first time, actually, that a US court had ruled on whether poker was a game of uh, chance or a game of skill. And they ruled that it was a game of skill. There's a footnote to the story. Um, the following year when uh, this, it went to the state appeals court. Now, in New York state law, uh, gambling is defined as anything that has a material element of chance. So if you think about it, this, it's a much narrower definition of gambling. It's not predominantly chance as anything with a material element, which clearly poker does have, and under this condition, it's defined as gambling. And this debate is ongoing. If you look at kind of fancy sports in the US and a lot of these systems where do we have something that's luck? Do we have something that's skill? You know, where do we, do we actually define these things with gambling? I think there's often a temptation, in fact, with the situation to put things in boxes. You know, we like to say there's a box with luck and there's a box with skill. Um, I think typically, if we're good at something, it goes in the box on the right. If we're bad at something, it goes in the box on the left. Um, and that's really kind of tempting, but I don't think it's a realistic um, notion, necessarily. Um, I think particularly you know, through the history of how people have tackled games like roulette and with lotteries, it's much more of a spectrum. And actually, games that we might think are the archetype of luck, things like roulette, actually, if you have a skillful approach, you can tame that chance, and you can convert it into some element of a game of skill. And even games that we might think are incredibly, uh, or almost solely the world of skill, games like chess, can have um, surprising results of chance. In the 90s, um, famously, IBM's Deep Blue Chess Computer played Gary Kasparov. Um, and during the match, uh, in one of the early games, there was a situation where Deep Blue made a move that was so unexpected and almost kind of so subtle that it threw Kasparov a bit. And it, it by all accounts, con convinced him that he was playing something that was just simply beyond what he was you know, ever seen before, just something completely beyond his capability. Um, it turned out, actually, that what happened there is Deep Blue had run into a situation where it couldn't identify the best move. And in that situation, it had been programmed to pick randomly. So this, this set of games that is one of the landmarks in artificial intelligence over humans in a game that is thought to be purely skill was actually uh, really kind of shaped by this chance event. And I think these kind of illustrations show um, why gambling and why these kind of uh, games of chance are so important. Because really, whatever your views are of casinos and bookmakers, um, gambling is an inherent part of life. Betting is an inherent part of what we do, whether it's in health, in, in kind of prediction on this side, whether it's in business, whether in finance. We have to make decisions with hidden information. We have to deal with uncertainty. We have to balance the risks against the rewards. And I think that's why 
Historically, um, so many researchers have been interested in gambling and continue to do so. Because really, if you want to understand luck and decision making and risk, then arguably there's no way uh, better to start than with a bet. So, thank you. That was a, a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Um, I kept on thinking about investment management and what your view of where investing in the stock market might fall between luck and skill. Should I pay somebody a 2% fee for their skill in investing my money, or should I just rely on buying the market? Um, I think that's a, that's a very good question, and that's one that's often kind of compared with is investing gambling. And I think certainly in short term, sort of a lot of the day trading stuff, there is this large element of luck. Um, I think there's also just the issue with, with funds that you almost have this survival bias. That if you think of, um, so some people who are working on this proposed example, they have a set of funds who make completely random decisions, say. The ones who do well will do well and survive, and the ones that value would go bankrupt. So over time, you'll kind of see this successful set. Um, I think by no means it means that there's not an element of skill involved, but I think asking those questions about to what extent is there luck and skill and how do we measure that is yeah, a very good area and one that yeah, clearly there's a lot of money at stake. You mentioned earlier in your talk about how opponents can be flawed and at the moment we're just saying that they play pure strategies when we make models. Um, do you think there's any scope for mathematics in the future to almost account for this flawed play and factor that into our models so that we can adapt our algorithms? Um, yeah, so there, I mean, certainly in poker, there, there are teams who are kind of partly working on these optimal strategies against perfect opponents, but they're also looking at what's known as opponent modeling. So you develop a, a picture of what works well against them. And one of the things they found is that um, actually in poker, against humans, aggressive strategies work much better than they do against bots. So certain things that we're kind of susceptible to when we're playing, which maybe um, other people aren't. Um, and there's also this issue of if you're playing one person, these kind of uh, very defensive strategies can work well. But if you have multiple people, they can gang up on you, whether deliberately or inadvertently in a game of poker or any kind of situation where there's multiple people, they can have strategies which kind of take advantage of you. And in that situation, being defensive might not be the optimal thing. Actually, it might make sense to look for weaknesses and try to go on the attack. So, yeah, there is, I think that's kind of one of the interesting areas of where it's not a kind of simple two perfect players doing the optimal thing, but you've got these flaws and how do you look for them and, and not get exploited in return. Thank you. Um, I wrote a question down during the lecture. It's, it's a little bit silly, but um, it's sort of non-mathematics, but I was really curious. Um, you said that um, card counting was a very successful strategy. Um, why, why does it go wrong? What exactly goes wrong when it's such a successful strategy? How um, does it get found out? So, so with the basic card counting strategy where you keep track of what's gone in the deck and then when you get a favourable situation, bet on it. You have the problem that you're basically going to be sat at the table for a long time betting very small amounts of money and then suddenly putting tons of money in, which makes it sort of a big red flag for the casino. Um, and teams have tried to get around this. So, for instance, in the 90s, the MIT students famously would do it in teams. So what they'd have is they'd, they'd actually play up to sort of common stereotypes. So they'd have the kind of girls pretending to be the dumb blondes and this sort of thing. Um, and watching the tables, so you'd have somebody just watching and betting and then covertly signal to other people to come. So they kind of operate as a team to avoid this problem of security finding them out. Um, so I think that's really one of the challenges. is isn't the maths of it, it's just the ability to get away with it. You've also got the problem of, so this Kelly kind of criterion um, is betting proportions, but you know, potentially if a casino, if there's a sort of minimum bet of $10 or something, and your optimal strategy says you can't bet that, you can't sort of say, can I cut this chip in two? And, um, so there's are kind of real life challenges which kind of limit how much money you can make from it. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll just add to that, because I, I wrote a book, which I'm not going to plug, but um, <laughs> I, uh, I interviewed the captain of the MIT um, blackjack team long after he'd given up, and the amount of effort that casinos have put into to making sure these people can't bet. He walked into, he was telling Sandra Gleid about he walked into a casino um, to meet a, a client, because he trained people in blackjack, um, but he didn't touch the casino floor, and he hadn't been in this casino. And as he walked in, he got a phone call on his personal mobile from the head of security, who had spotted him on the cameras, because they got sophisticated software to do it, just saying, Mike, I, you know, I, I hope you're not turning left at this point. Um, <laughs> 
I feel under a bit of pressure now to make the question work. <laughs> <anyway>. <laughs> so you've talked about card counting and what goes on in the casino's views of it. But you'll be aware that uh, in horse racing, for example, there are a lot of businesses that work on setting the, the, uh, exchange betting companies, so yep. they set the punter against the, uh, the person that wants to lay the bet. Um, and you talked a lot about bots. Now, there are a lot of people that write bots in order to clean up in exchange betting so that the computer does all the work. So regardless of what you think about the horse, its chance of winning, etc., you just have a computer program, and as the money is put in, it will keep you know, clipping an edge and taking a profit for its win. A couple of years ago, there was a very famous example where one of the bots went horribly wrong on one of the famous exchanges. I won't name it. That may be in the book, but, yeah. but <laughs> there, there are very few, so you'll probably know who it is. So a horse that was uh, sort of 10 lengths clear with uh, less than a furlong to run was trading at about 16 to 1 and the, because the bot had gone horribly wrong. And a lot of professional punters that sort of make a living out of this uh, business sort of sought that and ploughed a lot of money into it and some that I know were standing to win 30, 40, 50,000 pounds on that but the exchange operator decided that well it was clearly a manifest error the bot had gone you know um, bizarrely wrong and therefore they uh, let the person that owned the bot off paying the money to the people that had taken advantage of it. Had it been the other way around, of course, the bot would have cleaned up and taken their money. It's not really a question, it's just a... <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a, a nice anecdote. No, I mean, it is actually in the book. Oh, it's, it's a leopard's down um, situation, I think, the one you were Yes, that's to. it, yeah. 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 Um, and actually, that, that, I think there was about £1,000 in that person's account, and they were on the hook for about £28 million. Well, my brother had £30,000 to win yeah. on it, and uh, <laughs> so um, vested interest. <laughs> But I mean, again, I think that's a great example of um, so some people who actually who looked into the bot, uh, the bets that were being placed, and it looked like the bot was placing a uh, doubling up strategy. This kind of classic, just ramping up. Um, but it is a kind of good question of, of who do you attribute blame to, and it goes back to these these kind of two stockbrokers who, if you design an algorithm, to what extent can you take responsibility for it? And you know, I think in in that situation, their argument was that this was such an absurd situation that, and you know, I don't think there's been any, any sort of legal cases following. Yeah, in appeal maybe, but... They, they tried to make a legal case okay. and then they sort of ducked it. But um, I think your point is well made that had it been a human at the other end of it without the medium of the bot in between, yeah. so the case might have been... Uh, um, you know. And I think that's a debate we're going to see happening yeah. increasingly often, you know, yeah. not only in betting but in, in other industries as well. Well, I suppose anyone that designs something that's, uh, you know, a sort of profit for nothing and sits back and taking it has got to take the risk that it goes wrong and uh, pay out when it does. But anyway, as you say, an anecdote rather than a question. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> apologies. Good one. Um, oh, well, given the microphones there, yeah. pass it to your left. I was just wondering if there are any um, games where humans can still beat computers. I mean, Bridge, for instance, is that one? I mean, how does it look between humans and computers right now? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, so one of the things that's, that's surprising, actually, and it's slightly annoying if you're trying to get a book out, is how quickly these things move along. And um, particularly for poker, so this, this announcement, I don't think many people were expecting um, this kind of limit poker to fall that quickly. And Go certainly surprised people that um, it was thought that these games were safe for a good deal longer. And I think just the progression in AI and ability to learn in not necessarily this, these kind of traditional ways are really pushing that. And I think actually, you know, Kasparov, when he lost to Deep Blue, made this point of, of almost people in AI would be disappointed because it was very much kind of just crunching the numbers and that wasn't learning anything about um, how humans uh, develop intelligence. I think these new games, which are pro progressing phenomenally quickly, are fascinating. So I don't know about that specific example, but um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some interesting developments to come. But poker was, the poker that was solved was an extremely strange version of poker, wasn't it? So, yeah, I mean, it is played, but not, yeah, so it's the, it's the heads, so it's two-player poker, and there's a limit. So the typical one is the no-limit version, where you can go all in, um, which is still unsolved. Um, there was someone front here. Yes. Thanks. Um, so I guess your day job, you're doing a lot of work on really trying to ascertain sort of the impact of low probability but extremely random and massively high impact events. And you also mentioned us being pretty surprised at the uh, rate of change of um, progression of AI in particular yeah. and surprising enough. Does that sort of pose any... I know there's been a lot of pop literature on this stuff more recently and 
huge spectrum of degrees of predictability as to you know how much of an impact this really poses or real existential threats. But I'm not sure if you have any general views on that and um, in your sort of field. I think that's a good question. I think the the, the techniques and be able to kind of learn from things. I mean, certainly when you have like genetic sequence data, you have phenomenal amounts of information that you have to process. Um, but one of the challenges, particularly in early stage of an outbreak, is almost small data. You just don't have much to work with. Um, and in that case, often the kind of back of the envelope, simple calculations are the valuable ones. So I think there are those, there's more detailed methods coming through. And it's kind of really exciting to see where they go. But there's also, I think we need to rely on the sort of tried and tested kind of stuff of you don't have much information, you have to make this decision now. And, and I think that's quite an interesting area to be in. Do you think ethics much has a bigger role to play as well? I mean, given that the role of big data is going to be access to the information and yep. probably the ability to have the tools to analyze might not necessarily be in everyone's hands. Do you think ethics has a big role to play in that as well? Um, yeah, I, I think it has a huge role. And um, I mean, one of the things as well with big data, it, you might have a data set by yourself um, that's not you know, it's seemingly innocuous, but if you can link it with other data sets, suddenly you've got potentially very private information about people. Um, and our line of work, you know, obviously, if dealing with health data, that's something you've got to be very careful about. But I think as this stuff becomes publicly available, and particularly, you know, things like genome sequences, where we don't actually know what's in there. If you think about it, you know, we, we don't know all, what all of these, these markers and patterns mean, and there might be things that subsequently come out which, which are kind of identifiable or problematic. And, yeah, I think increasingly with kind of data, that's an aspect of statistics and science maybe we should be putting more focus on. Great. Uh, well, someone from the centre section over there. The gentleman here in the uh, stripey. Um, you, you, you might have heard that um, in a few weeks' time there's a certain referendum coming along. Um, and it, both sides of this debate, they both say there will be either more or less immigration or more or less employment or more or less trade or more or less wages and whatever. Um, do you think either of them have applied statistical methods to come up with any sort of realistic base? <laughs> oh, that's a very difficult... I mean, they've certainly published equations, um, but I think with this kind of situation we have so much uncertainty, your assumptions are incredibly important, and it goes back to this kind of small changes can have a big effect, and it's incredibly... You know, I think in many, many situations, we, you, know, you lack the information to say something certain, and where you, in some cases, you see some of these numbers published which are remarkably precise. It's the accuracy. It's the accuracy, it's, you know, yeah. the, the decimal points. Um, and so, yeah, I think it, it's always kind of important to look at the assumptions and these kind of things. But, I, yeah, I think there's a lot of emotion and other things driving this rather than, uh, you know, hard statistics, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, I, I cover a lot of this for the, for the paper, and the thing I've been shocked about, often you look into statistics, and sometimes it's quite depressing how political statistics are manipulated. A really good example was the stamp duty change um, recently, which was, I thought, a really good thing. They got rid of the shelved tiers and made it centred on the way up, and they said the average house will save you, um, you know, this will save you £2,000 or whatever. Um, and it was absolutely correct, but that made people think, oh, that's the average saving. And if you precisely sold a house that was the average price of the average house, that would be your saving. But higher or lower, that disappeared completely because it was just below one of the shelvings. And it was such a shame. But that's how you normally get them, is they've sort of lied, but not quite. But what I found extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary about this campaign is this £350 million per week figure is an out-and-out -out lie. And it's emblazoned on the side of the bus. And I'm not saying the other, the other side haven't... They, they've stuck to the more sort of conventional form of statistical lying, which is to have it true, but not quite. But it's, <laughs> it's an um, unprecedented situation that I've come across that the side has been told by the head of the UK Statistics Authority this figure is wrong, and it's still on the side of their bus. Anyway. Um, is there anyone on this side who's got a question? Yes, uh, the, the boy there. Um, you mentioned the um, story with the scratch cards and also that one where the, um, the financial people noticed that the bot upped, the, upped its prices by exactly the same increment each time. How did these sort of things get noticed, given, I presume, with the scratch card, before you got a win and therefore noticed the thing, you'd have to buy up quite a lot? And with the financial bot, um, how, how did they actually get noticed? Um, that's a great question. I think for the scratch cards, there's probably an element of luck. I think he was handed a load 
which perhaps presented enough information. You know, typically when you have a code, there's a kind of key bit that helps you crack it, and it might just by sheer chance he ended up with one of those. Um, and it wasn't definitive. I think he, he kind of bought a few, few more, but it happened that it was such a clear pattern that he was able to spot it. Um, I think in finance, actually, there's a lot of people out there. Um, there's one the class of algorithm called a sniffing algorithm that basically just kind of looks around and sort of tries to work out if there's something going on or some kind of behavioral pattern that they can pick out. So I think there's a lot of people who put a lot of effort into trying to spot these kind of unusual bits. It's like the guys looking at roulette tables. You know, you want to spot something unusual and then see if you can take advantage of it. Great. Um, thank you very much indeed, everyone, for coming and asking such great questions. And I'm sure you'll want to say thank you to Adam by buying his book. <laughs> thank you. Join us again in two weeks' time to hear Alice Roberts talk to Richard Dawkins about his extraordinary career in science. <laughs>